So, thank you very much for having me, and we're going to go ahead and start it off. So, my history, before we go into the fishing. Obviously, I'm not a Florida native. You can tell from the accent, right? <laughs> yeah, I was born in Queens, New York. Uh, my grandfather uh, was a World War II vet. His leg um, was amputated, so he was limited, and he wanted to keep healthy. So, he took up the art of surf fishing. So, you can get out there with one leg um, and walk the beaches and take me out at six years old and said, here you go, here's a 12 foot rod, here's a six inch plug, throw it as far as you can. <laughs> so I did. And I kept doing it and doing it and doing it. Eventually I started catching striped bass and started catching bluefish. And from that point, from six years old, to now in my mid forties, I've been throwing lures and using spinning gear and fly gear. I, I'm not a live bait fisherman. I use strictly artificials. Everything is artificial. And I have such an assortment of knowledge on soft plastics, on hard plastics, on bottom bumpers, on jigs, top water, subsurface. What you learn with me in two, let's just say two <coughs> or three um, sessions would take you 20 years to do on your own. Because through our whole course of the guided trip, it's a one-on-one -on -one experience. It's me and you together, one-on-one, -on -one, or me, you, and another person out on the water. You're asking me questions. You're watching how I throw <coughs> my lure. You're asking me, well, how do you make it you know, skip underneath there? Or how do you make it bump? Why did that redfish hit this lure? And I watched him hit your lure, but I put my lure that was the same lure in the same spot, but he didn't hit mine. Because I may have done something a little bit different. Okay, And that's the experience you have with me. You're walking one-on-one. -on -one. So let's begin. Wade Fishing 101. Guys, first thing is first, who wants a lure? Anyone want a lure? Who's, does anyone do any snook fishing here? Oh yeah. On the beach? Sure. Beach snook fishermen, raise your hands. All right. So, I like to give out a couple of lures. I have a lot of sponsors that help me out. And by the way, these ain't cheap. They're about $17.99 a piece. Um, Everyone gets a lure. I try my best to help out all my fellow anglers. It's not, again, it's not about the money, it's about the principle. Okay, snook fisherman, first one, bingo, that's you. <laughs> oh, I got you already. Next one, <laughs> snook fisherman, that's you. All right, guys, let's move on. Wade fishing 101. What makes wade fishing different from kayak fishing and fishing on a vessel? Anybody? Convenience, convenience, cost, doesn't cost you nothing, okay? You use Google Maps, okay, that area looks good. Can I park? Okay, let me go in the water. Now, are you gonna be able to read Google Maps? Maybe. I can look at a map and tell you if there's gonna be oyster, if it's gonna be a deep, deep pothole, if it's gonna be a shallow pothole, if it's gonna have a trough, if it's, if it's gonna have a gut, um, if it's gonna have mangroves, if it's gonna have overhangs, if it's gonna have dark bottom, light bottom. Those are all things you need to consider especially in the winter time. These fish are cold blooded. So we live in the subtropics. The first thing you think when you're out in the water is where are these fish gonna be? They're gonna be where the bottom is warmest. Why? Why is the, why is the, fish, the fish gonna be where the bottom is warmest? Bingo. Food. Okay, so getting back to weight fishing 101. So you get out in the water and the difference between Myself and other people that are on a vessel or a kayak is I can move in silence. You guys can't. If you go on a kayak, you have hold slap. You have paddles. You have the you have your hand paddle, you have your foot paddles. The fish can sense that they have lateral lines. They hear you if you're only in one to two feet of water. I mean, my client's been with me. I've caught a red fish in front of him in nine inches of water. And he's right there and he'll tell you the story. Now, if you're on a boat, you ain't getting in nine inches of water. And if you're on a kayak, yeah, you, 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 may have, you might be in the kayak, but you, you're barely moving. You're dragging the kayak through the water. They're going to hear that. You're going to spook them. So another benefit of wade fishing, you're moving in silence. The next benefit, and it's very simple, you stay healthy. It's excellent for your body. Okay, I like to stay in shape. Now, I've been a professional guide for 10 years where I was able to leave my career and do this full time and make a good living at it and start umbrella companies from this. And the reason why I was able to do that is because I do this 
anywhere from three to five times a week, and I do anywhere from 10 to 15 miles a week in the water, okay? You stay in very, very good shape doing this activity. Now, I've got clients that are 40, 30, 50, 70, 80, and I had one that was 92. And he managed to walk two miles with me in the war, 92 years old. So age is just a number. And when you first get into weight fishing, okay, you're gonna notice that you know, it, you're gonna feel it as you progress and as you start to, to learn it and do it more often, it gets easier. Next aspect of weight fishing. So we have silence, okay, that's our benefit. The next thing that we have that most people don't have when weight fishing, is you have the ability to feel the bottom with your feet. Okay, I can feel, I can walk around. I can walk into a pocket and I can feel a temperature change. So let's just say I'm walking down with a grass flat and I see I have eel grass over here, turtle grass and a whole bunch of potholes. Well, I know in those potholes there could be a, a, a predator lurking because it's an ambush point. Okay, so knowing that there's an ambush point visually while I'm walking through the skinny water flat, I know it makes perfect sense for me to throw a lure in that direction. Does that make sense, guys? Sure. Okay. Wade fishing makes your life a lot easier. It's a little harder on the body, but it's a lot easier to catch fish, and you catch bigger numbers and more quality fish. Why? Because you can get to where nobody else can. And most of the spots are right here in your backyard. I have 14 wade fishing spots just in Lee County. Catching red, redfish. Okay. Redfish, redfish, redfish. Who likes who likes catching redfish? Thank you, sir. Those lures are very unique. They're one of the companies I'm sponsored by. They have a rattle in the boot of the tail, so when that bait swims, that kicker tail goes like this and knocks, which is going to draw. Who else likes redfish? Oh, sorry, gave him ten. <laughs> Uh, one for you. Not me. <laughs> All right. Now, these are my lures. Okay. I um, partnered up with a company called Bugs Fishing Lures out of Magnolia, Texas. These are designed. I just want to show you these for our waters. Years and years of testing, and we have came up with a hybrid, which is a jig and a fly, combined in one. You won't find them anywhere around here. Um, you can buy them online, go to my website. This is just an example of some of the baits I would use for snook, redfish, and sea trout. This is what we call the Ned Minnow. Okay, when that gets wet, ever heard of a greenback? Yeah, sure. Greenback. Okay. What's that look like? Shrimp. And it clicks. And it's weedless. Okay, so you that, that is, with a fly rod or? Nope, this is all done on spinning. All spinning. Now we're gonna go a little bit later in our presentation. I brought my winter box for everyone to take pictures at and ask questions about. My friend, that's for you. Thank you. Who else likes redfish? No. Right there. That's for you, sir. So after our presentation, um, we're gonna, you know, feel free to ask me questions. We're going to go through the box, um, and then you're really going to see the goodies. Because this is my box I take when I got it. So if, I, if you hired me right now, say, okay, I want to go out with you tomorrow, this would be something I would be bringing along that I would be tying onto your, you guys' lines. Any questions so far? Shoot. Are you using uh, fluorocarbon? Absolutely. I use a seven foot St. Croix Avid Inshore. I have yet to find a better rod. I've been using it for five years and I am not sponsored by them. I use a Shimano um, Stratic XG3000 yeah. with 225 yards of eight pound braid. I throw only eight pound. Yeah, okay. I can cast the lure with eight pound an eighth of an ounce lure, 50 yards. I can cast a quarter ounce plug, 100 yards. Why, am I, why would you ask, would I need such distance? And you will see it on my videos. Stealth. The farther that lure is away from me, the more of a chance it's got to get bit. It's got a longer way to come back, 
that lure lands nice and quietly, I'm 100 yards away. That fish has no idea I'm there. So it's a more realistic presentation. It's easier on the body. My setup weighs less than 11 ounces, my rod and reel. And, I can, and it can handle up to a 50 to 60, 70 pound tarpon, an eight pound braid. And I only use 20 pound fluorocarbon cigar. Any other questions? The braid that you use, so you use only like a, a seven strand, eight strand, nine strand? I use the trod and true, and, and I, I call me an old school native Florida boy, eight pound power pro and moss green. Okay. Eight pound power pro, moss green. That's all you need. Anything above 10 is overkill. There's no need for it. A, the fish are going to see it, especially when you have clear conditions. B, you're limiting your casting distance. And your goal, whether you're fishing from the shore, whether you're fishing from the boat, or whether you're fishing from the kayak, is to get that lure as far away from the structure you are on so that fish does not know you're there, okay? There's been many a time where I would walk, and my client will tell you, we were walking along and, oops, right on my feet. Redfish sitting in the hole. And I made one step, bloop, bloop, oh man, it's true. <laughs> They're everywhere. Okay, you just have to know about where you're fishing, why you're fishing in it, and should you be in that spot that day. And that comes with A, doing your homework, B, booking with me, C, watching the YouTube channel. It's free, okay? You'll learn how to read your tides, okay? Fish like moving water. The water is not moving that day. It's going to be hard to find fish feeding. But if the water is moving that day, it's going to give you a better opportunity to hook into a trophy fish. So moving on, weight fishing. What are the downsides of weight fishing? Because there are some. That's a, but there's a downside. That's that's the downside. But what's the upside to that? You're limited, okay? Because you're you know you maybe you know me I can go three or four miles, but my average client can go an easy mile, mile and a half. But what's the upside to that? You become a better fisherman because you're limited. So all the spots that you guys would miss, now you're like, I have no choice, I have to fish it. So now you start to work hard and say, oh, you know what? I didn't see that hump before. I walked over that hump a million times. I've been to the flat five times and I never fished it. Any hump, any depression, Remember, you're on a grass flat. This is not like up, up north and big rocky bottom offshore. You're on a flat. So any divot, any depression, anything a fish can hide behind or hide in, they're going to use because they are an ambush predator. They're predators. Look at a trout's mouth, okay? I'm known for trophy sea trout. Okay, I was 10 pounds away from the state record. I caught it right here in the east wall, Cape Coral. Most people don't even know about the east wall. It has one of the largest sandbars in the world. I took my client right there in the back, Larry, out there, and he was like, good Lord, nine miles of open, beautiful water that you can walk. You could, I've been fishing it for 20 years, and I still haven't conquered it. 20 years, I cut my teeth, and no one was there to teach me. I had a couple of old times I threw shrimp out there, and I'm like, I don't throw shrimp. So I bought a pack of DOAs that looked like a shrimp. I said, okay, well, he's throwing shrimp. I'll buy some that looks like the shrimp. And then I'm going to start walking. And I walked, and I walked, and I walked, and I walked. And guess what? All of a sudden, I started catching two, two trout, five trout, 20 trout. I have a video. I catch 100 trout in one day. And I got it all on film. I've got clients that never caught redfish. One of them played for the Minnesota Vikings. We had, I believe, in four hours on, on, a, on a, one little particular oyster bar, we had 30 trout. 10 redfish and seven snook in four hours on the guy to trip with me. I mean, he was just, you know, at the end of the day, he was like, here's $500. You know, I mean, well, thank you, thank you for the tip. Um, but let's get back to, to weight fishing. So, now you know the ins and outs of why it's beneficial um, and the downside of weight fishing. And there really is only one. It takes work. Good for your body, but in the beginning, I mean, you're gonna feel it. I mean, I'm gonna show you, if you see the size of my calves, okay? That's, 
it, it's work. And a lot of people don't do it because they say, oh, you know, I just want to go on the boat. I, I don't want to go, I, I, I want to go on the kayak. I want to sit back and relax. But you know, sometimes you ever heard the old saying, you know, the, the more work you put in, the more you get out. Well, when you wade fish and you start learning to walk the water, walking it correctly, you become a better angler. You start seeing things you did not see before. Okay? Because on a boat or a kayak, you float or drift past them. Okay? It's very simple to get on a kayak and just go down the flat. <coughs> Whereas if I'm walking a grid and I said, okay, I'm going to hit this area, then I'm going to hit this area. This area doesn't look too good uh, from, from my conditions, but I know down in this area it will. And you consistently work those areas with the techniques that you learn. Those, tech, the, those proven techniques, okay, and the way you use the lure, the way you use the wind, the way you use the tide, okay, the way you cast, the way you use your cadence. There's a certain way I'll use a bug's lure versus a certain way I'll use a DOA lure, okay? Um, they have the old, the old saying, you know, it ain't no use if it ain't chartreuse. An old timer told me that, and I'm guilty of it. I believed for years that the chartreuse was best thing since sliced bread. But then I found something out. And this is very important, guys. When a trout, a redfish, and a snook are fingerlings when they're young, the first things that they eat is moss, algae. It's the first food they taste. And I never knew this. And I, I, I was like, well, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, the first food that a sea trout and a redfish and a snook eat when they're that big is algae. Chartreuse is built into their biology to strike. That's why the old saying, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use if it ain't chartreuse, that's where it comes from. Because when these fish were younger, their first meal was algae. So keep that in mind when you're throwing lures. Any questions? When you walk these flats, yes, sir. Do, doesn't your the, the, the mud just suck your foot down? No, sir. I have a secret for that. It's very simple. Go to your local dive shop, walk in and say, I'd like to, a pair of neoprene dive boots with the zipper yeah. on the side, the ones with the hard bottom. Yeah. Make sure they're, they're, they're you know, zipper tight. If you wear them, you won't even get a shell on your foot. I pay $49.99 each pair, and I, you know, I wear them regularly. One pair lasts me a year, and I use it you know, three to five times a week, uh, depending on you know, a hurricane, you know, I have a little time off. But uh, for an average you know, user, if you go to any dive shop, uh, my brand is Henderson. There's about, five, I don't know, 60 or 70 different pairs out there. And I use three millimeter, uh, three millimeter neoprene, but you must get the zipper. As far as gear, that's what I carry. Everything in this little bag. From survival gear to antiseptic to everything in it to, to toilet paper. Everything in this little pack. It is a godsend. It's got a drink holder and it's got a rod holder. Where do you put the fish? Catch? I practice just about 100% catch and release. Okay. Not saying that my clients have to practice that. I practice that. Okay, um, once in a blue moon, you know, well, when we, when we could, I haven't ate a snook in 10 years, um, but, um, you know, a trout, if, I, if I'm in the mood, you know, it, it's, a, it's a decent size trout, I'll take a trout, or I'll take a redfish, or if my client wants to take a redfish, uh, I have the last couple of videos, we've been getting into some monster flounder, I, I caught my record flounder about three weeks ago, a 22 inch southern flounder on a bug's lure. That's my record. I've never seen one that big. In all the years I've lived here, I've never seen a flounder that big on the flat. That means the flats are healthy. They're coming in now. And then a week before that, my client got one that was 21 inches on a bug's lure. Uh, just absolutely amazing. And he asked me, he said, well, can I take the flounder home? I'm like, yeah, I mean, you can take what you want to take. I don't, I don't say you're not allowed to. I just personally practice catch and release to preserve our estuaries. Not saying that my client, if he wants to take a trout, 
he's more than happy to take your child home with him. Okay, yes, sir. What about bugs? Bugs. Well, it depends on what time of year you go. Um, if you go out and you walk through the one of the trails, and one of them is the Charlotte Burning Trail, took my client through there. Not too bad at all. Um, summertime, when you get up in the morning, no seams. I always wear a uh, fisherman's hoodie. You can buy a bass pro. You know what I'm talking about, the UV hoodie, yeah. with a, a face buff. And I'm good. If you want to put a little bug spray on, you're fine. But when you're out walking in flat, um, I rarely, it, I rarely get bothered. It's sometimes when I'm walking through the bush, getting to the flat, is when I'll get you know bit up. But then I will put a little off spray on. And that's all. Just don't get it on your hands. You get that spray on your hands, and you touch your lure, forget it. No fish is going to bite it. You might as well throw the lure away. If you get that that smell on your line, throw it away. If you use sunblock before you go fishing and touch your reel or touch your line and get that sunblock on that line or your lure or your jig, throw it away. Fisher's not going to eat it. Another, another trick, something I learned from the past. That's why I don't use sunblock. I only use a face. The minute you get that stuff on you and you get it on that rod and you start handling it, the fish is going to smell it. And it takes a long time. So if you, if you get it dirty, you might as well just put that lure in the box Wash your hands real good and retie. Okay, another benefit of weight fishing, and this is this is this is one of the ones that most people they 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 they, they tend to forget. Fishing is about enjoying the outdoors. It's about enjoying your lifestyle. Being blessed enough to live in our beautiful state of Florida, where we can get up every morning and go out in the water, especially if you're retired, you know? Uh, I'm not retired, I'm just lucky enough to do what I do and, and do it for a living. Um, go out and enjoy yourself. Don't get yourself frustrated. Rome was not built in a day. It takes time to learn. But with practice and understanding, you know, if this is something you wanna learn how to do, I guarantee you within a month or two, if not before that, You'll be able to go out there successfully, like my client has, on his own, where I took him and successfully go out there and know where to start and know where to end. Now, are you gonna catch fish every time you go out? You bet. <laughs> it's impossible, it's impossible. Okay, I've had clients who've went out one time, two times. We went out two times in a row. I may have caught a fish, because sometimes when I'm with my client, I'm fishing with you, I'm not just guiding you. So I'm sitting alone, we're talking about life, I'm guiding you, but I'm teaching you. You're watching me how I'm casting, how I'm reeling, how I'm fighting the fish. And then when it's your turn, I'm directing you. Okay, if you have a big snook on and he's jumping out of the water, shaking his head and you've got 20 pound um, floral carbon on there, you better know how to use your drag or that fish is gone. That fish is either gonna gill you or the abrasion on his lips are gonna run right through that, that floral carbon like it's butter. So I'm guiding you, open your drag, lift your rod, hold him high, bring him low, turn it to the side. These are all things while you're fighting, you're learning. And once you learn them, you can take them forever. You can teach your grandchildren, you can teach your family, you can take out your friend. Um, I don't believe in you know, not sharing my spots and my knowledge with my clients or, or not letting my, uh, my clients record me or take pictures. The goal, me, the Brethren of the Sea, is to help my fellow men and women become better anglers. And that's the whole goal, is to help you guys become a better angler. Um, and use the knowledge that took me 25 years to master and give it to you and let you use it. It's not as difficult as, you, as it seems. But it does get frustrated. It does. And the reason why it does is because you can't catch it. You know, all the stars can be aligned and everything can be going great. And all of a sudden, it just doesn't happen. You work as hard as you can. And the great thing about my company is when you book with me, if you do book a one day, a three day, because the majority of my clients book packages, okay? I have, I, I, it's not a guide service where you go out one day. You spend sometimes three, four, five months. You may book 
a three-day package and say, Mark, I want to come out one day in October, one day in November, one day in January. It's spread out. And the great thing about it is if you do decide to do that with me, if you don't catch that day, the day is free. No one does that. So if you don't catch anything, that whole day that you would be spending with me cost you zero. It's a free day. Even though I, I've given you seven years of my knowledge, it's how confident I am with my service and my ability to teach anglers such as yourselves how to catch redfish, snook, black drum, sheephead, jacks, you name it. Everything that swims inshore, uh, we can go after. I also like to point out that your, that your days, his days can be as long as you want them. Thank you. Dude, we don't put another time, yeah, I don't put an hourly time. I go all day. Um, I do this for a living, so I go until you basically put up the flag. Mm -hmm. When you put the flag up and say, Mark, I can't go no more. It's time to quit. We need to go back to the car. That's when our days are finished. I yes, got sir. a question for you, Mark, because basically I had back surgery, okay. sciatic nerve. Okay. I can only go about a quarter of a mile at a time. Okay. Are all of them two and three mile trips? No. Okay. So this is how we, so again, I design our programs to each person. Okay. Uh, my service caters to what you can do. Okay. And I'll know that by our conversations when we decide to book and then once we get out there. Now, when we're out there, I always have a spot for us to rest. So we go out for a little bit. My back hurts too. If it's day three for me, I'm, you'll, I tell my God, my back is killing me, man. You know, and I'll be sitting there <laughs> stretching. You want to take a break? Yeah. And we, and there's nine miles to sit. You know, you can pick a little, a little piece of mangrove, sit down, have your sandwich, watch the birds, take a picture, go back at it. So there's plenty of time, Good. plenty of places for rest, and we only go as far as you can go. And if we go, if you say, Mark, oh, I can only go four hours, but then it's a half a day. If you catch fish that day with me, it's counted as a half a day. Okay. If you go six to eight hours, it's a full day. But just keep in mind, if you don't catch a slot fish, I'm not gonna, if you catch a little lady fish this big. That's good enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's gotta be, it's gotta be a slot fish. You know what I mean? We're not here, we don't take, my company, uh, my motto is I'm not here to take advantage of the anglers here, I'm here to teach. And if I teach you the right way, right. it's only going to grow my business, and it, everyone's going to spread the word of, of, of what I do. I had that issue with the lake, so I just wanted to know. I got you covered, boss. Okay. I promise. All right. Henry, I'm on your list. Yes, sir. Just tie a pool noodle around his waist <laughs> and through the water. That's all. Well, if you guys want to hear a quick story before we go into the lures, I'm going to make it short and sweet. Now, this is something scary, and I witnessed it years ago. I used to be an old time out there, and he would go out there and he would take the pool noodle, this is what reminded me of it, and he had the pool noodle, but he put a board on top of it, and he had beer, and sandwiches, and a radio, just floating next to him. And he just, then we'd be floating, hey Mark, how you doing? How's it going, Bob? Doing all right, I got, I got 12. And he would just slay these trout. He'd go out there, and he'd get these mud minnows, and he'd get 20 or 30 of them. I don't know where he got them from, if he caught them himself or whatever, and he'd have his little, you know, little live well behind him. He'd hook up a live a, a mud minnow on a popping cork. He'd throw the mud minnow out there in the popping cork, and once in a while I'd just see him go, What's up, Mark? How you? And I'd be halfway down the flight. I just got a redfish. All right. And just every two or three minutes, that stupid popping cork was there. <laughs> And he just catch him one after the other after the other. Well, one day he broke he broke his where you know his um, where he used to keep his fish to, to bring home. At that time, I believe we could keep I think it was like five or something like that somewhere like five or six. So I forget what the limit was. But he had a stringer on. But he made a string out of rope. So he has a stringer around his waist, right? And behind him, he's got six bloody. You know, he's got the six bloody sea trout just sitting there. And I'm standing near him fishing, and I just hear a roar come up. And I'm like, oh. And I see a fin, and immediately I'm like, shark! Wasn't a shark. No, no, no. It was damn free willy. The dolphin came, and I seen the old man 
go help and just <laughs> down the flat he went. Oh, it drove him about 20 yards. The, the dolphin grabbed the fish and took him off his feet and there goes Bob. Flat. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm coming for you, man. I'm coming for you. Oh, you got that YouTube, right? No, I didn't. That's just pre, pre YouTube. Pre -YouTube. I wish I would have had it. I would have been a millionaire. It would have went viral. Um, so I run down there. I get him out of the water. I said, you all right, man? He said, was that a shark you're trying to attack me? I said, no, man. Free will, he got you. And, you know, so I called the dolphin. Sure, sure. So I said, yeah, you know, the dolphin came up and got a free meal, you know? So. Word of advice, if you are out there waiting and you are keeping fish, don't tie them to your waist. <laughs> and, you know, there's so many different types of soft plastic and different colors and different patterns. And this one makes this sound and this one does this sound. And what spoon should I use? In my classes, I will break all that down. So today I'm going to give you a brief, su brief summary of it, you know, as we close this uh, seminar out. But don't overcomplicate overcompl the water, okay? There's certain colors that stand out. There's certain colors that there's no need for, okay? If you have dark water, very important. Dark water, dark colors. Light water, light colors. Now, that's a vast array. I mean, you could what kind of you have browns, you have olives, you have reds, you have deep orange, you have dark green. That you can play with depending on where you're walking. Okay, if you see dark muddy bottom, chances are the bait fish or the crustaceans that are going to be around that area are going to have a dark tint to them. Match that hatch. If you see a pool of five or six hundred greenbacks, don't throw a damn greenback in there. How's the fish going to find it? Throw something that's going to stand out in that school. You see a school of bait fish and the trout popping everywhere. Don't pick out, say, oh, I got to get this something that looks like a greenback. No, no, throw something that's like a bright orange or, or, or a silver or you know, something that's going to shine. When you put it in that school, that's going to shimmer and stand out. That fish is going to sense as that that's the weak, the weak lamb. He doesn't belong there. Get him. Some more stuff you know little tips and tricks that i like to give everybody um when you're out there um again whether you're waiting on a kayak or a boat don't overcomplicate where the fish should be think like the fish i don't want to be cold i need to find food there needs to be, it, it, the water has to have some kind of oxygen so I can breathe. If it's really hot, do you guys get hungry? You ever work outside in the heat? Do you get hungry in the heat? No. You completely, you don't, your hunger goes away. It's just hot, you're uncomfortable. It's the same thing with the fish. So if you're out in the summertime and it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon, it's 104 with the humidity and there's not a cloud in the sky, you think you're gonna catch a fish? Not. You're not gonna catch nothing. The only thing you're gonna catch is a sunburn. <laughs> okay? Now, where you can try to catch a fish is you have to find deep, dark, and something that has cover. So if you found a deep, let's just say, if you found a dock, if you're walking, if you're waiting and it happened to be a dock, and, and outside that dock, you felt the water, you felt it's warm, but if you stepped underneath it, you felt a three or four degree difference, there's an inclination, a very good inclination, right, that there's gonna be fish there. It's another aspect of weight fishing. You get to feel your environment. I can't tell you how many times I've walked down the flat, Connor, am I lying? Nope. I've walked down the flat and I said, stop. Why? Hot spot. I just, a stream of warm water, throw out there, bang, sea trap. Absolutely. Enough to where I don't even know how many I can count anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thermal walls. It's so far. It's been so warm lately. Do you think we're going to have an early transition to spring? I'm hoping. Um, the hurricane, since we're on this topic, did more good than damage, believe it or not. It did damage to property, but what it did for the fishery was spectacular. It was Mother's Nature's way of cleaning out the garbage. 
the flats, all the, 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 um, the matted moss that was laid down on the east wall and over by the Sanibel Flats, um, up near Boquilia. All that, when all that water rushed in, it cleaned it out. All the flats are recharged. Now, the problem that's going on right now is that wind, that damn wind and that cold front. Every time you have a cold front, especially if it's close to a, a full moon, um, it's going to stunt them. It's going to stop them. Because they're, they're, I would say their hot spot or their comfort zone would be between 72 and 78 degrees. When you have that water temperature of 72 to 78, you better be fishing every day. Because that's, that's prime time, baby. And then once that stays consistent, you'll start seeing more and more greenbacks moving on, moving in. When you start to see the greenbacks moving in, you'll the, the crustaceans will start moving out. Now, me personally, I love cold water fishing because I'm a redfish hunter. Redfish is my is my forte, and right now, the prime you know forage is fiddler crab, blue crab, shrimp, and uh, baby mullet, baby finger mullet if, if if you can find them, glass minnow and mud minnow. But the majority of the fish right now are feeding on crab of all kinds. Doesn't just necessarily mean green crab. Yes, sir. What's a green bear? I'm from oh, oh, greenback. It's basically a scaled sardine. Okay. You'll see them. You'll see them shimmering around in the summertime if you walk along a beach. Right. So well, like a minnow, basically. A sardine. A sardine. It's yeah. a sardine. Yes, it's a scaled sardine. Um, they call it snook candy. This and that. You know, every single guide in the world, you see them. They catch a whole boatload with a net and they crush them up and then put them in thing and throw them out. There to chum up the water, and that's all fun and dandy. That's what they do. I'm a, I'm a hunter, okay? I, I walk and stalk. Um, live bait is in, it's in that in my nature. Right. You know, I go out there, I don't just fish, I hunt. So yes, the other question you said about the moss, did the moss get wiped away? It got blown it up into the mangroves. In the mangroves, so now is there a new growth of moss Correct. coming up? Another thing that everybody, no, no, the, the, the the, the, the moss or the matted algae, that was a result of the drop, the, the, the opening of Lake O, okay, oh, and, the, the, and the dump the crap. Yeah, all not. the stuff from Piney Point, all yeah. the stuff from Lake O and Ortona and that Franklin Lobs. Yes, that and that sits down and that smothers the grass. Right. And if you kill the grass, the whole ocean dies. Got it. The flats are the womb, if you will, of Salt water, it's, it's the womb, it's the birth, the, where everything is birthed. And if you kill that, everything else dies. So, one more thing I, I, I wanna leave you guys with is, remember this, in the winter, everything grows and everything dies in the summer. Most people don't know that. Um, especially me being from up north, you know, winter time, everything is shuts down, you know, it's the complete opposite here. Your grass dies in the summer. Your sea grass dies in the summer. It gets You're, too hot. Yes. Your mangrove leaves fall off. You ever notice the water turn, turns tannic? You know why it turns tannic, guys? The leaves are dying. Why does that happen? It's Mother Nature's way of feeding the water and the earth, um, the topography of the flat. Those leaves fall down. They they fall into the water. The vegetation, um, you know, it rots, it decays. That turns, then that turns into nutrients, and those nutrients now bring microorganisms. And those microorganisms bring small bait fish and shrimp. Those small bait fish and shrimp bring predators. You see the food chain? So it all works together. So knowing the biology and the ecology of our estuary system and our flats, and understanding the waters will make you a better fisherman. It's not all about, oh yeah, this is a great fishing hole. I've got, I got hundreds of great fishing holes and I could go there one day and catch 20 redfish and go there the next day and don't even get a sniff. It's, it's not about having a spot. It's being able to learn to walk to a spot and know how to work it, whether on a boat, on a kayak, or on foot. Gentlemen, yes sir. Do you do all your work with individuals or can you team up and take a couple Yes, people? Um, I, I will allow up to three people plus me. So it could be me and three others 
but because I have to be vigilant, make sure everyone's okay, and you know, it's 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 a lot of work because I'm teaching you, you and you, and I'm tying knots and I'm teaching you techniques. So three would be the max for the, for for a, for a trip with me at one time. And of course, I do have group packages. I do have single single packages. You can book a one day. I would advise you not to because you lose money. You're better off going with the three day package, which I explained to you earlier, um, which gives you the ability to work one day, then another day, or work a day to you know, go back to back, or go one, two, three, you can spread it out, and I can design the, the best day for you that particular month. It gives me a lot of leg room to work with my clients instead of saying, okay, well, I only got Saturday open. We catch them, we catch them, we don't, we don't. This allows my clients and myself to pick out the best day with the best conditions. Um, and of course, depending on you know how healthy you are as well you know some people can only go one day and then mark okay i want to but you gotta take a month off <laughs> it happens it happens so do we have any more questions about how about the gear gear yeah. gear yeah. what kind okay i could go for days what's no do you bring it or do we bring it? Oh, gear. Oh, oh oh i cover everything okay. except rod and reel okay okay and there's a reason for that my rod and reel setup costs 800 dollars yeah if you dunk it in the water, I mean, it'll survive, but it, you know, of course, dunking any rod and reel will cause damage. Um, so I do require any of my, any or all my clients to have their own rod and reel with line on it. But as far as lures and everything else, I cover everything else. Fly or spinner? Whatever you prefer. I'm, I'm just as good with fly as I am on spin. I'm doing both. Been a while since I've so, um, but if you do decide to do fly, just let me know because I have to. I would have to book a day yeah. around fly fishing conditions because yeah. it's a Wait, different game. Man. No, it is. It's, it's different weird. game. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How do you have to string your rod the way you described it, or whatever you have? Um, it, okay, so let's just, for example, you had a rod, and let's say um, you said, "Well, Mark, I've got a heavy action rod." What a 6,000 size reel. I would say, no, no, no. You need to go to the store, go to Bass Pro, and, and I've went with clients too. They've called me, Mark, can you come with me to the store or meet me at the Bass Pro and help me pick out a rod and reel set? Sure, no problem, you know what I mean? You're a client of mine. And, and that's how I keep clients. I, I have a 95% retention rate for my clientele. 95% of my clients come back, unheard of. Because they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I do, I, I do, I do recommend using uh, a medium action rod. This is what I use: medium action rod. You want to use a fast tip. Do not get a, a, a medium action rod, but a moderate. Moderate is a wet noodle. Okay, medium action rod, seven foot. Don't go seven two. Don't go seven six. You're not that advanced yet. Stay with seven foot. Okay, medium action, fast tip. Real, 2,500 to 3,000. There's no need to go bigger. There's no need to spend the extra $200 for, for 4,000. 2,500 to 3,000. Line, eight pound to 10. I suggest if you're new to the long casting and the waiting, stay with the 10 because the eight, if you don't know how to play it right, you'll get wind knots. And I know we, everyone knows what a wind knot is. You'll get them all day long out there. So stay with the 10. Once you get comfortable with the 10, then we can take that off and then we'll move you to the eight. Um, as far as gear, we already talked about that. Hats, sunglasses is a must. Everyone must bring at least a bottle of water with them. Always stay hydrated. I had two, I had two experiences where I was out there and I got greedy. I walked down to a place called the God's Cut. It's my name. Uh, he actually lost a 40. Yeah, I don't know. It was a nice sound. It was a big snook. Down, 42, Ross down there. 43 inch snook and a cut. We call it the God's Cut. There's an island here and an island here. And back behind that island is a bunch of oyster. And when that water pulls out of there, the snook and the river is line up like salmon. Just, just you see him just smashing. And I, he, I had him hit, cast on this point. And I'd throw a top water and she, she swung at it. Missed. He went in there with the... Oh, I think it was the paddle tail, I think. It was, oh, it was just a paddle tail. He threw the paddle tail in the corner, and I seen him, and he popped it, popped it, and all of a sudden, boom. And she came out of the water, and I was like, oh, my God, it's over 40. 
I tried directing him. <laughs> go left, go right. She started pulling towards the trees, and sure enough, she went like this, and went the opposite way, and there she went. There she went. But I got it all on film. Yep. <laughs> but it was interesting. All right, guys, let's get into the lures. I'm sure you guys want to see some of that. Okay, so we're going to start it off. Everybody, and when I say everybody, until my new top orders come out. <laughs> Always have a bone top water, one with inlines, one with troubles. Now this is just a bone and it's got silver flash. It's a Heaton Super Spook Jr. As you can tell, they have been demolished. Okay? The best top lures out there when all else fails. The bone, not white bone. Bone, when that fish looks up from deep down, it looks exactly like the bottom of a mullet. Bone. Now, I'm a huge spoon thrower. I'm old school. The spoons, I've got videos. I can tell you, <laughs> we went out there with everything we got. The only thing they would hit is this ugly thing right here. This is an Aqua Dream spoon. It's fantastic. It's weedless. I have it hooked with a split ring and a swivel, not to the line. You want the swivel to the lure. And why do we do that? We do that to avoid line twist. So when this thing is spinning, it's not twisting off your line and into your reel. And if that happens, you might as well pull all your line off and throw it away. That's why we do that. Love a little secret. Spoons, very effective. They can be launched anywhere from 30 to 75 yards. These are a quarter ounce. This is a handmade um, by one of my old sponsors, and it's actually you know, the good old gold spoon. Okay, Redfish's favorite color is gold, just so you guys know. Gold is a killer, but this has a built-in rattle in it. So that's a handmade, it's a custom lure. Um, I usually just use the gold aqua dream, but I always got a gold, and I always got a white. Always. It's always in my box. Next. The good old paddle tail. <clears throat> DOA stands for deadly on anything. If you are using a paddle tail on a flat, you will, if you just stayed using this, all, just this, this right here, all day long, nothing else. I will bet my car you will catch a fish. Not the way I throw it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll teach you. Yeah. The, 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 the paddle tail is always in the box. And now I use different colors for diff different situations. If it's windy, if I have cloud cover, if I have, um, if it's the springtime and I've got greenbacks and I've got glass minnow and I got mud minnow and I got mullet, well then I'll go there. But right now, this is one of my lures. And this is, again, a hybrid. This is a, a fly, a solar fly, and a, and a paddle tail hybrid. This is called the trout thumper. Black and gold right now has been killer. This has been that, the color that has been getting everything, black and gold. I have been catching everything, on it, including flounder. Black and gold is the goal. So, soft plastics wise, I made up a pack of, at, for, for, as if I was going to guide today. So if I was taking out a client, go ahead and pass that around. That's what I would take. If, I, if you hired me and said, Mark, we were going out this morning, that's what, 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 what was coming with me for the conditions. So while you, so while you guys are looking at that, <clears throat> Can I ask you a question? Sure. If you were going to target flounder, okay. how would you fish him and what would you use? Perfect. Perfect. Well, if I was targeting flounder right now, <clears throat> I would be using um, the Ned Bugs <clears throat> from My Flats Kit, which you can order on bugs, at bugsfishinglures.com. You can look, and look for Mark Weasty 
Winter Flats Kit. It's $79.99. It comes with eight pieces. And these two right here, what do they look like to you? What do those look like? My ex-wife. No. <laughs> <laughs> Baby shrimp. Yeah. Okay. So because they're top weighted, what happens is when this lure gets casted, she sits just like that. Just like that. What, where, do, where, do, where do flounder and redfish feed? On the bottom. Yeah. But you got to, they're predators, so they're lazy. So what am I going to do with this? I'm going to make it go like this. Just like a shrimp. Just slowly moving. So the, the lure is going to get casted. It's going to hit the floor. And then I'm going to go pop, pop, because it's cold, and I'm going to let it sit, because shrimp don't move too fast. Shrimp move very slow. And I'll pop it again, and then let it sit. And because it's weedless, it can be thrown anywhere. Also, my favorite, and this, and I have the other one on, on my, my line, is the Beastie Bug Crab. Oh yes, that's a crab. Oh yeah, there's the claws. I was gonna say it looked like a baby chicken. Yeah. <laughs> when it's in the water, okay, this this will sit just like that. And it, you know how a when a crab gets mad, it rears up. Well, when that when it's wet, you can't really tell right now. Yeah. But when it's wet, these two appendages are gonna are gonna go like that and breathe. So that's gonna look like a crab just reared up. Now, the one I would be using, I wouldn't be using this one. I'd be using the blue crab. And that's actually on my rod right now. <laughs> but yes, fantastic. Next, if they didn't like that presentation, if they didn't like that presentation of the net bug on the bottom and it wanted, a, and it wanted something to look more like a shrimp scurrying, well, then I would switch to the hothead bug, which is a shrimp. But if you look at it, it's a lot different than the net bug. It doesn't sit like this. It sits like this. So now it looks like, ready? The shrimp is scurrying away. By the way, one of the best bonefish lures in the world right there. So if you look at it from that point of view, that looks like a little shrimp laying on the bottom. So these are some of the lures that I would have brought with me out on the guided trip today from the conditions and my, from my experience that would be ready for whatever clients I had.